Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers Podcast with your host, Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers Podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics, including health, fitness, and training strategies, to name a few. If you enjoy the show and wish to support, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon or wish to make a one-time donation, please visit the show PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. Links to both of those can be found in the show notes. Also, consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform and on our video version of the show hosted on YouTube. For updates and notifications, please visit my social media channels at Zach Bitter on Instagram, at ZBitter on Twitter, and at Zach.Bitter on Facebook. If you wish to sponsor the show or have any other questions or feedback, please reach out to me at HPOPodcast at gmail.com. Hey folks, just a quick announcement before we get rolling with this episode. I just uploaded 26 unique training plans to my website. They range from 12-week base building plans all the way up to advanced 100-mile training plans. If you're looking for a bit more guidance with your training, please consider checking out my offerings at zachbitter.com. That's Z-A-C-H-B-I-T-T-E-R.com. Once on the site, click the link on the top titled Training Plans and see if anything fits your needs. I'm also looking to continue to add to this catalog, so do not hesitate to reach out with any suggestions. Thanks, everyone. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. This is going to be episode five of the Dietitian's Dilemma series, where I've been joined by Michelle Hearn. And then each one of these episodes, we bring in an expert for a specific topic within her book, The Dietitian's Dilemma. So this guest uh, is uh, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and uh, she's actually a third time now guest of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. We had Dr. Lyon on in the early days, it was episode 71 to chat a little bit about protein and nutrition. And then uh, she came back on again for episode 178 when we wanted to just talk about uh, nutrition in the kind of the context of pregnancy. So since then, Dr. Lyon has now had two two children so uh I've the, overachieved. yeah the family's <laughs> growing the correct family's growing so uh welcome welcome back michelle and i guess welcome back again dr line i am so thrilled to be a three-timer i'm sure we won't stop there <laughs> yeah yeah hopefully not no i'd love to have you back on as many times as you're willing to give us so uh uh cool yeah so we're um i i'm uh, michelle i might let you kind of start this one off if you want <laughs> since uh it's your book chapter and, and you haven't had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Line as much on podcasts as I have. Uh, and then we can kind of get rolling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we talked a little offline, but I'm just, I'm thrilled to have you on Dr. Lyon. I've, I've followed your work and, um, you know, I think sarcopenia is not something that we talk about a lot. You know, if you're, if you go, my experience in the healthcare setting, you know, we see a lot of diabetes, we see a lot of obesity, um, certainly see a lot of heart disease and, you know, some of the things that go along with that dementia, kidney failure, but, you know, not a lot of people are talking about sarcopenia, but we see it, you know, I saw it a lot in my time in the acute care setting. And so if you're, if you don't mind, and I guess, yeah. you know, Zach, <laughs> you know, you it's your third time on, you can certainly, <laughs> um, you know, give a little bit of your background if you want, but can you just, yeah. can you talk a little bit about your experience, like what you saw, um, you know, throughout your, throughout your career? Yeah. So um, obviously my name is Dr. Gabrielle Lyon and I practice this concept of medicine. I founded this kind of medicine called the muscle centric medicine. It's the Institute for muscle centric medicine. And actually what I don't get to talk a lot about is where it came from. And it came from my time at WashU where I did a fellowship. It was a combined fellowship in nutritional sciences and geriatrics. And as we were talking offline, geriatrics is really the end of life. And while we fight about everyone in the middle, right? Everyone can talk about optimizing performance, but I think a very underappreciated health concern is this loss of skeletal muscle. Because you know, you had mentioned Michelle that diabetes, Alzheimer, cardiovascular disease, hypertension. And I would argue to say that these are diseases of skeletal muscle first. So we see a decrease in muscle mass and function early, early on. Originally, this concept of sarcopenia, which we think of as a disease of aging, 
actually can begin in your 30s and 40s. And that becomes incredibly devastating. And we've all seen it, right? We've seen our parents or grandparents shrink. Their muscle fibers change, them shrink. And the things that go along with this are obviously changes in metabolic health and just being able to basically function. Fall, I mean, we know if someone falls and breaks a hip, the chances of them getting out and recovering are, are slim. It's very grim. It's tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting before I shifted into more of like the low carb field, like, um, even when I was a newer dietitian, like what I saw in acute care, somebody asked me, they said, you know, what, if you could give somebody, what would the number one tip you could give them in nutrition or like it out of everything. And my, my first thought, and I, I said this for a while, I said, don't stop moving, you know, had nothing to do with nutrition because I, I had seen people become so deconditioned. Yeah. You know, like you said, you know, once you lose your muscle mass, you're, I mean, once you break a hip statistically, the, yeah, your, your rate of recovery is not good. And, you know, in my time in acute care, I often heard doctors and I heard other people say like, look, as you get older, like you're just, that just, this just happens. This is not something we can really slow or we can really stop. Um, but I questioned that. I said, you know, we have accounts of, of people living very long lives, you know, especially historically people hunting, fishing, being very active into their eighties, nineties. And what I saw in the acute care setting, um, and you might've seen this as well. Uh, and obviously we've seen this in people in their sixties, seventies, eighties, but I saw people in their forties and fifties that were so overly fat and so under muscled, they mm -hmm. literally couldn't even walk the few steps to the bathroom. Right. And, you know, you question like, what is going on here? So yeah, I guess I will ask you, you know, in your experience, is this just an inevitable part of aging or is there something we can actually do about this? I think that that's a great question. And first we have to define sarcopenia. The definition is not, you know, it, there's different working groups of the definition. So as we think about the framework, we'll say it's a decrease in muscle mass and function. And while we think about it as aging, you know, as it relates to aging, it's exactly as what you say, it can begin in your thirties and forties. And I believe what's happening is that, you know, there's a few reasons, there's a few working paradigms as to why we believe it happens. There is an, an inevitable change in skeletal muscle. The reality is we do age. We do lose muscle fibers. We do lose the nerve innervation. We do lose the ability to recuperate. And of course, as we age, we're up against increasing in inflammation, inflammatory markers like CRP and you know, TNF alpha. However, if you think about the ability to change the trajectory of aging by really optimizing skeletal muscle in your youth and decreasing systemic inflammation and optimizing for hormones as we age and mitigating extra medications, and of course, optimizing for protein and nutrient status, vitamin D, then the potential to change what we see and what we have come to accept as common and inevitable can change. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, working in the hospital, working in clinical care, I often saw, um, you know, I would see doctors and I would see well-meaning dietitians tell patients, especially even elderly patients, you know, on a, um, a heart healthy diet, which we could go into how I feel about that, but I, you know, that would take hours, heart healthy diet or diabetic diet. They would say like, they would say, I want you to keep your protein small, you know, three to four ounces. Um, you know, soy protein is fine. I want you to reduce meat. And often what I saw, and I know this has been your experience from what I've seen you post is when you tell somebody to reduce meat or reduce you know, high fat cuts of meat. It's not like they're replacing it with a very nutrient dense food. Yeah. Often to patients, that means, oh, I'm going to have another roll. I'm going to have another, you know, something very starchy, very sugary. And what we end up doing is we take maybe the small amount of protein out of people's diets and they're just replacing it with processed carbohydrates. And my, I'm sorry. Yeah. In my experience, it's, it's one, one of the worst things you can do is tell people the small amount of protein they're getting. Cause yeah. we know statistically elderly people eat less protein and, and correct me if I'm wrong. They don't synthesize protein quite as well. Well, you bring up a great point. They have what ha what happens to um, older tissue. I don't even want to say elderly because there's some research that has been coming out showing that individuals that are obese also have an impaired anabolic response. Mm -hmm. And when you think about aging tissue, so we'll, we'll talk about aging tissue and there is something called anabolic resistance. And what that means is the capacity to sense the amino acids is blunted. So an individual will need a higher amount of high quality protein, but actually as it relates to amino acids, because of course we eat for amino acids, we simply don't eat for protein to stimulate 
skeletal muscle to stimulate that mTOR pathway and muscle protein synthesis. So what happens is, and I think where a huge part of the problem is, is our current recommendations of nutrition are, you know, number one, they focus on the 24 hour uh, overall amount of protein that you ingest in a day or a 24 hour period, which is wonderful in many ways until you have a health condition that is highly inflammatory, right? So you are now in a highly catabolic state and breaking down muscle, using muscle for those amino acid reservoirs, or you are older. And when I say older, you know, in the literature, it's defined as 65 and up, but arguably the older tissue can begin much earlier. So the bolus amount of protein that a person needs to ingest at the very low end is 30 grams. And at a more optimal level is 55 grams of protein per meal. That is desperately hard for an aging individual, an older individual, a sarcopenic individual there. You know, if anyone has had clinical experience with the elderly, they don't need a lot. It's dentures are an issue, right? It is hard for them to chew steak. It's hard for them to get high quality proteins. You know, they're typically the tea and toast diet. So the current narrative, which is, you know, go more plant-based and, you know, red meat is bad for your health. Wouldn't it be further from the truth, especially as it relates to aging? Because if you believe the current narrative, your older parents or grandparents didn't have a chance. That's, th these are all really interesting topics and points. And I want to just ask kind of a quick question in relation to this type of stuff. And uh, I mean, we look at just the different kind of rankings that we give protein sources in terms of their quality and or bioavailability. And then just the second step, in my opinion, is that now we have to look at like practicality of it too, where it's like, okay, you can get X percentage absorption from this particular like plant protein or this animal protein. But then what does that typically come packaged in that someone's going to consume on a regular basis versus just kind of getting all your protein from like supplementation or shakes and things like that. And no one's really going to argue with you about like the bioavailability of protein from animal sources. No, they, they might. They, oh, yes, they will. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they will. They, they, they will like argue. argue I will, biological numbers. Yes. <laughs> I will say they will argue uphill with you about that. But um, my question then is like, how does that, if at all, change as you do age, we get into this like lower availability type of scenario with our elderly population, do those percentages remain somewhat similar or do they degrade at a similar rate between animal proteins and plant proteins? I you know I that, that even. That's interesting. Um, in terms of the degradation rate, there wouldn't be a difference, but what does happen as individuals age is we see a decrease in stomach acid. So they will often say they feel tired or they're having difficulty with the absorption issue. And, you know, sometimes you're dealing with, um, decrease in intrinsic factor or the way in which you can get B12. So as an individual ages, make, it's interesting at both ends of the spectrum, right? At the very young, like my babies, every bite matters. Every bite matters to the very young and to the very old. I highly recommend that aging individuals or older individuals are eating high quality proteins, animal-based proteins, whereas, hang with me for a second, whereas midlife, there's some negotiation, right? So if an individual is incredibly active and they're choosing lower bioavailable proteins as it relates to in a plant matrix, they can get away, away with it because they are highly active or, you know, training a lot or whatever it is that they're, they're doing within their physical activity. But, you know, as individuals age, as individuals age, it does become harder for them in some regard to digest dietary protein and then supplementing with a hydrochloric acid uh, or, you know, betaine HCL can be helpful. It, it almost sounds like the, the value of like something like whole milk is obviously ideal in the early stages. It's why that's what we give our babies in a natural setting, but that may come full circle by the end of life when we're talking about like digestive degradation, potential yeah. like chewing issues with the dentures yeah. and things like that. It's like, what better way to get those bioavailable proteins for, in a liquid form the way we kind of started out as? Yes. And whey protein, it's really interesting. Later on in life, whey protein is fantastic. And whey protein, I, I think of as a food matrix. It has other, it has alpha lactalbumin. It has, you know, a protein called CMP or GMP. It has other kinds of protein, lactoferrin, that have bioactive 
um, activities and they function as a prebiotic, they augment the immune system. There's a lot of other reasons why individuals would consume whey protein and they don't have to consume nearly as much. So, you know, for individuals who are not hungry, getting 20 grams of a whey protein, because again, we eat for amino acids, allow to, you know, essentially optimize muscle so, protein for an aging I saw frequently in the hospital setting, and I want to really highlight something you said, because I think it's fantastic, and I'm not sure people like it, really got it, is you said 30 to 55 grams of protein per meal. Because the recommended, the RDA right now is that's a lot, that's a lot more. <laughs> the RDA will have a, a, you know, 150 pound woman um, getting about 54 grams of protein per day. Right. right. So what my experience in the hospital too, is we would often encourage people to drink um, boost or ensure drinks that maybe have 10 grams of soy protein. And then they have lots of sugar, right. which, you know, I was, I was definitely not a fan of like, I'm, I'm with you. White. It would make a lot more sense to have a very high biological value protein, like a whey. Um, and then I also think like, we just do such a disservice from um, telling our elderly and even people in mid age kind of trying to steer them towards plant proteins and steer them away from a, you know, something very, you know, high right. in the biological value protein. I totally agree. And then what happens is the narrative shifts. So typically people and individuals are predictable. They're largely habitual and yeah. they do the same thing over and over again. So if we skew the perspective of individuals in midlife, as they age, they typically take their patterns with them. Yes. And if this happens, then, you know, I'm, I'm afraid to see what the next generation of elderly look like. I mean, it, it is quite possibly going to even be more devastating because one of the other things is that when you lose skeletal muscle, you also lose this ability to regulate glucose as well, right? So we know that depending on the skeletal muscle mass, there is an increase in you know, um, dysregulation of glucose. And when that happens, you become diabetic or pre-diabetic and insulin resistant. And there's all these other things that happen and we know the downstream effect of that. Yeah, that's an interesting point too, because I think sometimes we focus on like with the elderly, you have this scenario of like the frail person who falls and breaks their hip or who uh, has a hard time getting enough calories in, but there's also the population of elderly that we're probably seeing an increasing number of where they're obese or even morbidly obese into their old age. So now the exercise component is that much more difficult and you're kind of fighting this, this like kind of two front battle essentially where you want them to be getting in enough high quality protein, but you also want them to be kind of slimming down a little bit so that they're not having all these risk factors from being obese as well. And then it kind of opens up that same door again of like, well, how do we want to package this protein that we're giving them? Do we want to lade in it with a bunch of extra carbohydrates and other you know, energy sources when one of the, the kind of dual targets is to try to get them to lose a little bit of body fat, uh, but still get them the right high quality protein? Yeah. You know, it becomes very challenging because the geriatric recommendation is for individuals not to lose weight. And that is different than in any other uh, scope of people and any other group of people. As a geriatrician, they recommend that individuals actually don't lose weight and, and they also tolerate a higher blood glucose and a higher A1C to be considered normal because there is, there's just all kinds of pathology that happens as individuals age. I think if we were to wisen up the best thing that we could do is that perhaps we don't even focus on weight loss, but we focus on altering that body composition aspect. And that of course is where the high quality protein com, you know, comes in. It, it is challenging because we know how long it takes to shift the perspective of medical professionals. In addition, research takes quite a long time to actually get out to the public for implementation of clinical practice. Well, well, you, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you can't see my face. I, that is news to me. I did not know that um, they, <laughs> that was the recommendation. Yeah. So you have somebody who's massively obese and they, they don't I want to say massively obese, but I would say that the recommendation as geriatrician, you know, that they recommend, you know, we're not talking about morbid obesity, but okay. typically we, the, the recommendation in the geriatric um, space as a physician is that they recommend not to lose weight. Of course, this isn't necessarily my recommendation, but this is <laughs> the overall standards of the way in which the, the way in which medicine is practiced that, um, 
people are very concerned about weight in general, because typically individuals, as they become older, do lose quite a bit of weight. And of course it's muscle, but they do lose quite a bit of weight. And um, weight loss in an aging population, an elderly population is dangerous. The Dietitian's Dilemma podcast series is made possible by our friends at S Fuels. S Fuels is both Michelle and my workout, recovery, and lifestyle product of choice. They don't leave our carb craving friends hanging, but make sure they stay true to their roots by boasting a wide range of low carbohydrate products to help anyone make low carb living and performance much easier. Personally, I like to lean on their S Fuels Life Mix and Revive in my morning coffee just to give me a little bit of extra fat fuel and protein to start the day. Their life bars I'll turn to when I need a protein pack snack on those higher energy demanding days. Their S Fuels Train product when I need a bit of extra fat for a long workout and their Race Plus to help keep liver and muscle glycogen topped off on my harder, longer efforts. You can check out their full lineup at sfuelsgolonger.com. That is S-F-U-E-L-S-G-O-L-O-N-G-E-R.com and enter promo code ZACHB5, that is all caps, Z-A-C-H-B, the number five, for 5% 5 off your next order. Thanks for tuning in. And now back to the show. Yeah, and I think uh, the logical thought here is that, well, what we need to do is we need to encourage younger and middle-aged folks to start getting some strength training into their programming or into their lifestyle so that when they do reach these ages, it's not a scenario where now we have an older, relatively weaker person trying to first start to learn strength movements, which also comes with a risk factor as well. If you're trying to do that at the first time and you're as an elderly person. Um, but obviously you can't go backwards and do that with someone who's already in that position. So is there like a standard protocol that maybe you would prefer or that we're seeing become preferred for say someone in their 65 plus year range who is battling sarcopenia in terms of like, what's the proper like programming from a strength standpoint? Right. Well, you know, I think number one, what we need to think about is prevention and really truly educating and thinking less about performance indexes and, you know, sport performance and really thinking about longevity, which is the majority of the population. And right now, the, you know, when the conversation is about longevity, it's about a lot of other things other than skeletal muscle and other than optimizing for protein. In fact, if you listen to the current narrative, they will tell you the opposite. Mm -hmm. So educating and having foresight to realize that knock on wood, if we are lucky enough, we all get older. Um, it's a privilege to grow, grow old and really thinking about that trajectory early on is essential. The second part of, to that is it depends on obviously the training status. Stu Phillips at McMaster's University talks a lot and a lot of his research is based in you know, obviously performance, but also in the aging and elderly. And he would talk about volume, that it doesn't have to be necessarily heavy, but there's a certain amount of exertion that has to happen. And he's got protocols in his studies. But again, I think it's very interesting, more so than diet being very specific. I think training is, is very specific to the individual because we, we have no idea their training age, no idea their injury. Um, but of course, weightlifting and less cardio, even though cardio is important for mitochondria, weightlifting and resistance exercise is a cornerstone for prevention and counteracting the progression of sarcopenia. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think too, what my, my mind goes to a, like one area too, where it's like the practicality as well. Like when you have someone who's 65 plus, their big question is probably more around just lifestyle movements that are going to benefit from strength in certain areas. So like, you know, standing up out of a chair or reaching yeah. up above your head to pull something off a counter, things that are going to be practical uses in their day-to-day -day life for them to stay independent. Uh, and I was just curious if the programming emphasizes that type of kind of more natural movement versus, you know, maybe like your, your typical weightlifting routine of like deadlifting and squatting and that sort of stuff. I would say that it doesn't. I would say a lot of the, you know, as my time as a geriatrician, that is not something that is typically talked about or done. And I, I do feel it's very archaic, right? I feel that there's not enough uh, information in the medical literature translating to clinical practice. So it's, it's not really like that. And I think that, 
you know, again, if we can move the needle earlier and catch the individuals earlier, then we can train them for life and their activities of daily living, they can continue that. Um, you know, there's the, the silver sneakers, but you know, by the time you're in silver sneakers, I feel like, I feel like, and this is going to be a little controversial, but we don't push our aging individuals hard enough. We're very careful with them. And I think it does them a great disservice. You know, we know that if you look at some of Doug Patton Jones's literature, if we put someone on bed rest, within a week to two weeks, there's an exponential decline in their strength. They lose lean muscle mass. So um, being super gentle, per se, with individuals, I think it really harms them. It domesticates them even further. I, um, as I have to interrupt here, I think you may have just become one of my heroes, Dr. Lyon. I, <laughs> I think I saw, and this is just, and this is something that I witnessed. So this is also my experience. And this is, this is controversial and there is a line, but in my experience as a clinical dietitian, I think we coddle people. And I think we do a great disservice to a lot of our patients. Um, I saw this a lot with diet, like, oh, this person is obese and diabetic. Well, sugar makes them happy. So we need to keep giving them sugar. Oh, this person has, you know, kidney failure. Well, this makes them happy. So we'll just do this medication, you know, like most people are just, if we give them the correct information, if we empower them, most people are smart and are tough and really want to get better. You know, people want to have a quality of life. And, you know, I think what we're, we have to look at too, and what we have to do earlier in life is we have to catch, you know, most people are not eating enough high quality protein. That's and it's honestly true. not as easy as eating an egg in the morning and a tiny bit of chicken. Most people need, we need to start teaching people to like way easy tiger on the carbohydrates, stop right. having a big bowl of Cheerios in the morning and start having some eggs or start having some steak. You know, we need to get people to really shift how they think about that. And we need to get people to shift how they think about exercise because most people do zero minutes of any exercise. Like that's statistically correct. I mean, you know, in the book we cite, like, you know, the CDC has this, you know, 30 minutes a day. I mean, most people don't even get close to that. And when it comes to resistance training, Dr. Lyon made a great point. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, when you talk to people in the hospital and even younger people, thirties, forties, they think of these like huge weightlifters, like, wow, you know, it, it just has to be enough to, to start to put stress on your muscles. Right. And that can be literally, I had, I, I was talking with a woman in a hospital. I, I helped, I gave her two cans of soup. I was like, we can literally do bicep curls with this. Like this is going to start to stress your muscles. Right. So but what that takes, that takes health professionals teaching and talking about this, you know, because most people actually want to eat food that tastes good, you know, high fat meats. Most people want to be moving in a way that, that, you know, helps their body, but they just don't know and they're not educated. And instead of like thinking, you know, oh, my grandma's so elderly, I can't make her mad or I can't push her. You know, I think we need to start, start pushing the envelope a little bit here, because if not, I agree with Dr. Lyon. What we're going to see is this generation, my gen slightly older than me and maybe even my generation that is living on, you know, soy burgers and pasta and playing video games. It, it's going to be a big problem in 30 to 40 years. It is. And, and I also think another point is that people avoid resistance. They avoid the harder thing. And I think that that's a fundamental cultural flaw, right? Mm -hmm. I think that as a culture, we all need to toughen up a little bit. And it's okay if something is difficult, it doesn't mean to turn away and do less. It actually means to lean in and do more. And I think that if we really think about what that looks like in terms of health, it looks like doing the harder thing. So it's just, it's yeah. just yeah. And it's uh, if you, if what you're doing is easy, then it's likely not stressing the system in a way where it's going to actually progress in a meaningful way. So you have to find that that, that line of difficulty. So whether that's starting out with soup cans and then eventually getting to more, more weights or something, then you, I think you probably have to look at that at, at the individual level, but the, the general message of let's do something that's difficult relative to you is probably a pretty good message for most people. <laughs> yeah. And then do a little bit more than you think you can, mm -hmm. right? Because what often holds people back and, you know, I've just seen this over and over again, been seeing patients since 2006, right? That's a long time. In, you know, my, my opinion, I've seen a lot of patients and ultimately they can always do more than they think. They have to be willing to let go of their current paradigm of boundaries and the things that are confining them to really, like you said, actually put a meaningful stress on the body. It's okay to be in discomfort. And I'm not going out, listen, I'm not saying go hurt yourself. But I'm saying that your actions today, the things that you do today 
really dictate the quality of life later. Yes, yes. How much how much different would the health of our elderly population and even like you said, 40s, 50s, if we said, you know what, as, as physicians, as health professionals, as dietitians, everybody they saw said, you need to, we're, we're going to help you, teach you, encourage you to put a meaningful stress on your body. We're going to make you uncomfortable for yeah. short periods of time. Yeah. And, and we're going to really teach you how to make sure you're getting enough adequate protein in your diet. And for most people, honestly, you're probably going to have to reduce the, in some cases, eliminate, depending on what you're doing, sugar and carbohydrates. Like we said, this is our standard. We, I truly believe we could shift the, our, the health of our nation. I figure we're not, and it doesn't have to be hard. People, like you said, I think people get so paralyzed thinking like, I just can't do it. And you have so many different messages. It's like, you know, it's, it, it's the laws of science and nature. You stress the body enough. You provided enough high quality amino acids to, to repair. You rest, you do it again. And that's kind of the, the process. I mean, that's, in my opinion, I think we've really overcomplicated it and we haven't empowered our patients on how to do this. I totally agree. And then of course the uphill battle is the, you know, big industry and big pharma that really controls the narrative. And and that's a challenge. But if, like you said, if there's a good grassroots movement and we lead from the front and we lead by example, by doing those things and speaking out a way that is respectful and certainly encouraging and showing it can be done, then I do believe that we absolutely can change the world. Yeah. Interesting. I have one, one other question I want to kind of circle back to with like the protein muscle synthesis, uh, kind of question, because when, when I've had guests on in the past and we've talked about protein, one, one kind of reoccurring theme, I think that we've noticed with some of the more current research around protein is that the big first step is going to just get enough protein in per day. So that one's going to cover like the majority of your progress. But then once you hit that point, you can make some maybe smaller improvements on protein muscle synthesis by hitting like say 30 grams of protein three to four times a day spread out between, I I believe it was like three to four hour windows. So that's age sensitive. That information would be age sensitive. Okay. Yes, it is very helpful that a younger person who's highly active thinks about how much protein they're getting into a day. However, the literature is very clear for an aging population that they must reach a threshold of 30 grams. That is very, that, that is very clear in the literature. So if a younger population has their 24 hour protein intake, overall intake, that's great. But we know that the anabolic response is diminished in an aging individual and they need that two and a half grams of leucine to trigger mTOR. And the sub threshold below that number does not stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And so, I will tell you that if someone is resistance training and then having um, high quality protein after an older individual, that will improve because you know just by thinking about it, there is increased um, blood flow to the muscle. There's increased nutrients to the muscle, so that will actually augment the muscle protein synthesis response. So post training, they actually can get away with a little bit less. But I would say that that, that, that literature does the 24 hour while good is not optimal for an aging population. And you can see that in the pro age study, um, which was done a while ago. They, they do recommend discrete meal distribution and the three to four hours comes from the reset of mTOR. It's probably longer. So it's probably more like five hours, um, to then allow for the, uh, mechanisms to reset and then stimulate it again. So as you kind of push further in age, that small step forward by spreading it out becomes a bigger step forward just because Absolutely. you need to trigger that protein muscle synthesis. Yes. Um, yes. And you know, when you're young, when you're little, um, you can get away with a full anabolic response with five to 10 grams. So like my daughter, who's not even two, she could eat five grams of protein and get a full anabolic response because she's driven by hormones and she's growing. She's not growing like this. She's growing like this. But as you age, you know, that, that does change. And, um, you know, being very conscientious about how you're doing it, you know, you don't want to pulse small amounts of protein throughout the day. There is an issue with overstimulating mTOR. You know, obviously mTOR is in every, you know, in all the cells, whether it's the liver or the muscle. And we know that muscle is exquisitely sensitive to amino acids. The mTOR is exquisitely sensitive to amino acids, but it, you know, it's, it's not an optimal way to go about life by pulsing protein throughout the day. Not a great idea. 
in, oh. in my professional opinion. Yeah, no, and I would definitely agree with you. Um, and also to just to, to be clear and thinking about kind of like my experience in the hospital is it's if you're going to get 30 grams of protein per meal or a minimum of 30 grams of protein per meal, let's say somebody, um, an elderly person, like this is something that it, you're going to have to um, put effort into and think about. It's not something that you're just that just is easy to do or maybe even natural. Like you said, I, my experience is um, a hospital breakfast is. French toast, juice, and coffee. A hospital lunch is uh, plain spaghetti with uh, maybe an ounce of meat and a cookie. So, I mean, I had patients get to the end of the day where they had 300 grams of carbohydrates, and maybe 40 grams of, you know, a lower quality of protein. So can you just kind of for our listeners say like, what, what would that look like? And I, you know, certainly you could say like whey protein and stuff, but for somebody who's elderly, like how, how would you structure that? Or how does that kind of look? I would say that if they could hit two meals of 50 grams of protein, so the first meal is most important, I would say, because then you're setting up your metabolism for the day, getting 50 grams of protein, you know, even 40, you could start slow depending on the, you know, how big the appetite is, but I'd really try to shoot for 40 to 50 grams. And that could be, you know, five ounces of ground beef. Mm-hmm. Easy. And I know, you know, ground beef tends to be much easier to absorb. Let me rephrase that. It's easier for individuals to masticate, you know, chew it and also absorb it. It is and because the surface area is, it, you know, there's big or whatever, but um, that's an option. And people are like, that's disgusting. I'm not going to do that. So they could have five eggs, mm-hmm. have a big omelet, or you could have a whey protein shake. And again, it doesn't have to be an even distribution of protein, which I've talked a lot about. And initially that's kind of like the initial step of what someone could do to optimize themselves would be, um, you know, an even distribution of protein, but protein doesn't need to be evenly distributed. That is a first initial step. But what you could do is if an individual wanted to have two big meals and a snack or two meals where you're hitting 55 grams per meal, that can also be done too. Yeah. And my experience on the hospital too, is people genuinely, um, tend to like those things. They like higher fat things. They like eggs. Um, you know, they like, um, you know, ground meat, they like steak, they like, you know, lamb chops, but they have been taught that these things are bad for them. I need to reduce my eggs. It's high in cholesterol. I need to have oatmeal instead. And, and so it's, I feel like we're also kind of fighting a lot of misinformation when it comes to how much protein you're supposed to have. And then, like I said, we put patients on these quote unquote, you know, heart healthy diets where they, where they're not, can't have anything. And so I've often, I saw family and friends sneak in food because you, and then the food tends to be like donuts and pastries and very sugary treats. So it's like, it, it's kind of a mess. Yeah. And there's a lot of problems. For example, you know, we have 40 million people on statins. Uh, Big Pharma definitely supports the American Heart Association, which would then say cholesterol is bad for you. Dietary cholesterol is bad for you, which we know that dietary cholesterol is, doesn't impact in a negative way, of course, blood levels, cholesterol, but there's an inherent body set point. And if you care about cholesterol, then you've got to care about carbohydrates and excess calories. So there's all kinds of narratives that happen, you know, and of course, you know, this is not meant to be all or nothing thinking individuals do have, um, you know, genetic components where maybe they have, um, hypercholesterolemia, you know, I'm not talking about that, but I am saying that the narrative of saying that oatmeal is heart healthy comes from funding, you know? Yeah, I think uh, to me, when I'm thinking of like this population, it's like eggs and yogurt seem to be a slam dunk. It like kind of, they're super easy to, to make some variety with those, those, and also very easy to, to eat if, even if you struggle to chew and kind of have that sort of stuff. So those, I guess, unfortunately, no one, no, none of the families you saw, Michelle, were sneaking in uh, full fat yogurt and, and, and <laughs> omelets in their purses right. and in bags and whatnot. <laughs> no, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lyon nailed it. There's a, there's, there's a huge misconception when it comes to cholesterol and specifically LDL cholesterol. Like mm-hmm. if I eat steak, if I eat eggs, my cholesterol will raise. If my cholesterol is high, I'm going to get heart disease, you know? And I, even talk about, you know, my book, like I I saw a pretty scary relationship between people who were on statins and people who were coming in with strokes. Like, um, I think the evidence for prescribing a statin for every human that has high LDL is pretty poor. At least that's what I've, I've seen. And I I agree. There certainly are certain circumstances like hypercholesterolemia where, you know, maybe you aren't able to eat so much high fat stuff. 
But in general, yeah, people are bringing in high sugar, high processed um, chips, cookie, lots of lots of things that really don't serve health, certainly don't serve muscle mass. Um, Because the the narrative, you know, they they often think like, oh, this is I'm just giving grandma a treat or, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think if people really understood and really just grasped how valuable animal nutrition is, like you can completely I mean, that's that's always my message. And my hope is like, man, you can shift your health in a relatively short period of time. Certainly if you're older, it may take you a little longer, but within six months to a year, you can gain muscle mass. And Dr. Lyon, please correct me if I'm wrong, but you can certainly gain some muscle mass. You could certainly lose fat mass um, by shifting your diet and increasing resistance exercise. You can always make improvements, truly. You can always make improvements. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, yeah, with the, with the old, when we get to the older population, I think one of the things that, uh, that I, I'm really interested in too is just kind of the, the lifestyle that is developed over the course of their life where when, when you hit a certain age, it's like to some degree, I see a lot of kind of routines that are heavily impacted by kind of their upbringing and their life and everything. I, I always go back to one of my friends in high school who had a grandpa and he uh, was, you know, he grew up on farms. He was always outside doing stuff. And basically until uh, till the day he died, he was out in the woods pulling, you know, dead dead wood out of there for firewood and things like that and it was just like as long as he kept moving it didn't seem like he was ever going to slow down and then by the time he he did start slowing down was because he did get an injury and couldn't move and I think he probably just lost lost his appetite for you know life in general when he couldn't have the activities that he had done in the past and uh, I think the big big question here then is well how do we instill lifestyle habits that ingrain that at an early age through the middle of your life so that that's just kind of default and it's more like prying it away from them versus like trying to encourage them to do it i think that's a million dollar question and i i actually think that comes from less science and more kind of the ethos and core values of the family because if each family unit kind of steps up to do the harder thing and has certain um, you know, values, then in those domains, then that trickles over. So essentially it's leadership from the front. And this is the million dollar question. And how do we improve that? And how do we make people want to physically work hard and have discipline? Those are, those are great questions. And I think if we all do our part, you know, I, I think that there is leading by example and doing your part talk is totally cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I think the other, the other side of that, that I was curious about, and I can appreciate there's probably not good evidence for or against this, but I'm curious what like, just like early nutritional habits play in terms of the, the rate at which some of this like protein degradation and like difficulty with that goes like, is it, if I had say like from day one, or even when I was, uh, when my mom was pregnant with me, if, if she was eating like low protein, poor quality protein, and then feeding me that throughout my youth, does that even independent of whether I'm able to build muscle through my youth negatively impact me in another way in terms of how poorly I'm able to kind of stay on top of that as it gets more harder as I age is someone who's really on top of that from like day one, have an easier time outside of just habit. I mean, of course, this is purely speculation, but I would say yes, likely, right? You know, my daughter eats a very animal-based diet and I'm hoping that she doesn't rebel and do something different, but we do, you know, in clinical practice, I see individuals that when they have trained when they are younger, they look incredible. They're in gymnastics, if they're in sports and they have a certain level of fitness in their youth, regardless of kind of what they're eating, I have just seen them Trans, I've seen that translate to really higher levels of fitness as they age. And of course, that's just clinical experience. I haven't read anything about it. I haven't seen any studies, but it is truly interesting to see that. It's interesting. And it, my, my kind of follow up to that one is, uh, or curiosity, I guess, is you know, one thing I realize, and I think most people realize, is if you acquire a certain strength component or muscle development component at one point in your life. And then maybe you step away from it in some cases, like you get injured and like you lose muscle mass or something like that. When you kind of come back to that activity, you tend to catch back up to where you were before much quicker than you initially built up to it. 
So if you had someone who was like very active in their youth, say like up to their thirties and then just stepped away from physical activity for like a decade, two decades, and now they're entering their, their more elderly age, does that still kind of carry true compared to someone who's just like super inactive their entire life Would that, that elderly person maybe have a little bit of an easier time regaining some of that muscle mass than say the person who had been sedentary the majority of their life? This is a, so this is a fiber type question and um, I am going to speculate here. And I would say that if you've trained in your youth, depending on the kinds of training, and then you stop training that if you go back, that there is a certain kind of blueprint, but again, this is a, a fiber type question, more of a molecular question. So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know the answer, but this is what and I know the answer is out there. This yeah. is the question for Andy Gelpin. Zach, you're going to yeah. take a couple decades off? Like, yeah, I'm not planning on it, but you know, there's all kinds of worst case happen. scenarios here. <laughs> there's other things that happen though. So then you get this infiltration of fat tissue and that becomes, you know, that it's not just the muscle mass. It's also the quality of the tissue. So when you're thinking about stopping training and then you're putting on excess body fat, you know, you do see some, and we've seen it in a marbled state. So there are changes in the skeletal muscle that happens. You, you do get um, infiltration of fat tissue, which certainly affects the metabolic activity and the quality of the muscle, the strength of the muscle. And um, is that reversible? I think it becomes much more, diff- you know, the older you get, because number one, can you train as hard as you would like to, right? Do you have that uh, capacity, that horsepower? So um, there are issues with that. Can it be reversed? I'm sure that's certainly individual. Um, again, exercise and nutrition always can improve something, but you know, taking two decades off, nobody don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, but for people who maybe like somebody is listening to this that's just like hasn't worked out in a very long time, maybe is overweight, maybe is that's dealing it. with depression. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, is like, and I know you said this a little bit earlier, like it does matter, right? You know, you can start pretty much anywhere. And and I love that you even, you said that, um, you know, it, it kind of can even come from like your family. It's like, you're setting the standard saying like, well, Hey, and you know, in our family, you know, we, we believe in self-care. We believe in, you know, fueling your body in a way that's going to make your, your mind and your body strong. We believe in eating an animal-based diet. We believe in doing hard things. We believe in, you know, going and playing a soccer game and running fast. It's okay to lose. It's okay to, you know, um, you know, to have those challenges. We believe in, you know, doing hard things, but back to my question, like somebody potentially listening to this, um, where, like, I guess even like, where would you start? Like, how do you even get started? What, what, what would be some like kind of basic advice for somebody? Um, like just say they're eating the standard American diet. They're not doing anything like they're over fat, they're under muscled. What can they do? First thing that they need to do is they absolutely need to eliminate any narrative, any narrative of it's too hard. I'm too fat, it's too late, any of those things. Narrative, it's gonna be like cement blocks. So number one, we eliminate narrative. Number two, you have to take personal responsibility as it relates to nutrition. And that just means you are gonna figure out how much protein you need. And if you are, your goal weight is 125 pounds, you're gonna eat 125 grams of protein. Okay, that's step number one. Or, you know, actually, I think that we're now at step number three. Step number four, would be if you're going to have carbohydrates, that you have carbohydrates as it relates to a meal tolerance. You begin to think about carbohydrates as a meal threshold, and that would be 40 grams of carbohydrates per meal or less. And I personally don't recommend 40 grams of carbohydrates in the first meal, because again, if these people have been inactive, you earn your carbs, right? So if they're going to eat carbohydrates, I'm not asking them to do something radical, but it needs to be limited to 40 grams of carbohydrates, perhaps later on in the day, maybe the last two meals. And fat is whatever, you know, if it's within their caloric range, whatever that is. And that's how I would do it. And anything over, um, you know, I hesitate to say this, but really anything over 90 grams of carbohydrates, they should earn if that's what they're gonna be eating. They should earn it through exercise. So our recommendations having most patients eat 350 grams of carbohydrates, you think that's a little high? No, the the RDA recommends 300, uh, the RDA is 130. The, the recommended well, I'm saying in, in, in the hospital setting, most patients are getting, you know, 250 to 300. It's insane. It's a problem. It's a problem. And then the conversation is like a daily conversation, just like protein is a daily conversation. It's not, you know, I think that we need to really rethink these 
concept and think about, you know, um, the meal threshold relates to how we measure diabetes. So we look at uh, elevated blood glucose over a two hour period of time, right? So anything, you know, above a certain level is considered diabetic. But if you actually go back and calculate and you think, well, where does that get disposed of? If someone is sedentary, then you can determine if they understand the why that they will keep their carbohydrates at a meal threshold, right? So 30 grams of carbohydrates could go to liver glycogen, and then you've got brain, skeletal muscle, and obligatory use of organs. And so all that, all those numbers combined is going to be a max of 50 grams per meal as a meal tolerance. And I, I know that that was maybe a little too in depth, you know, I don't want to lose anyone. And it's really hard to kind of imagine what that looks like. But if, if people understand the why, then they can never forget it. So if you know, and you're eating these cookies and you're like, man, I should not be eating these cookies and I should definitely not be eating over 40 grams as a sedentary person of carbohydrates per meal, then they'll rethink it because, you know, we know that these issues, that the things that they're doing now, I mean, Alzheimer's is type three diabetes of the brain. Nobody wants that. Yeah. I always think of professor Don Lehman with this particular topic because, uh, you know, he's, he's certainly not ketogenic or strict ketogenic, but he'll talk about what he eats personally in the context of like the protein yeah. side of the thing. And he'll, he'll, he'll describe it with the context of he'll target about 200 grams of, per, oh, I'm sorry, 200 grams of carbohydrate per day. And the context is that in there is he plays uh, quite a bit of tennis and does some strength right. work. Yeah. So yeah. for, for him, he's probably thinking of that as, you know, there's this, this, this level of kind of maintenance carbohydrate that I'm going to stick to. And then what gets me up to 200 is the tennis matches and the strength training sessions. And when you look at that, that energy output that someone like he is, is producing, mm -hmm. then it starts to minimize that 200 gram number, which is essentially 800 calories, potentially in the context of whatever he's burning, probably, you know, somewhere between 25, to 3000 calories a day, depending on if he's playing a long tennis match or not. And, uh, and then, and then it starts to kind of like show up a little more kind of in full picture mode as to like what he, what he's actually doing with those fuel sources. Yeah. And he's eaten that way for, you know, I've mentored me for 20 years. He's eaten wow. that way the whole time. He's very disciplined and it's just, this is what he does. He found what works for him and he stuck to it. <laughs> what he does. <laughs> That's awesome. amazing. But yeah, most patients, I mean, every, pretty much everybody we're seeing in the hospital is not uh, playing tennis matches or super active. You know, most people are so sedentary. So I really appreciate you breaking that down though. Cause I do think people sometimes they just, they'll just eat what they've always eaten. They're going to eat, you know, the, the sugary coffees and the French toast without really thinking, you know, what, what is happening to this food I'm eating, you know? And then, like you said, we have companies, uh, pharmaceutical companies giving them you know, drugs or insulin. It's like, well, I eat this, but then I take the insulin and it, you know, my blood sugar goes back down. It's like, well, it doesn't go into a magical universe. There's consequences to that. Right. right. So and getting people to predictable. it's predictable. Yeah. We do yeah. the same things over and over again. And if you plan for your predictable nature, then you can start to make changes that begin to move the needle for individuals. Absolutely. This was awesome. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any other protein topics that we didn't touch on that we want to hit or did we cover our bases more or less? I just have one more, Dr. Lyon. Um, you know, there is a, I still hear this in the hospital, but I think the research doesn't really agree with this, but what is your opinion on, um, you know, I hear people say like, well, you don't want to get too much protein. You know, if you go over the RDA of 0 0.08 per kilogram, you could get too much and that's bad for your kidneys. We've never seen that. We've never seen issues with the upper limit. And there's been, I think, three or four now meta-analysis that talk about that. I think Stu Phillips also just published one, and maybe it was a couple of years ago, but the data does not support that. These are old narratives that die hard. Thank you. I just wanted to, I, I mean, yeah. I, 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 really, I know and I've seen that, but I, I'm surprised that that's still something. I mean, I was practicing up till just 2019 that I still had several doctors and dietitians say like, well, too much protein is bad for your kidneys or and I'm like, says who? <laughs> like, didn't we, didn't we clear this up like years ago? But anyway, so thank you. So yes, you guys, too much protein is not bad for your kidneys. It's not, it's not bad upper. for your bones either. Exactly. I, I did see something the other day that I was, I thought was kind of funny. I didn't look into it to see if there was accurate or not, but they were saying like, there may be a protein ceiling somewhere around like 300 grams where we start seeing some potential negative ramifications from that. And I just, 
caught myself laughing. I'm just like, well, how do you find yourself in a position of even getting close to hitting 300 grams of protein in the first place? Like to, to, when you just start putting that on a plate and looking at it, like you almost have to be eating like pure protein, uh, in some case, like you have to be doing protein supplements. I mean, you essentially would have to be in the bodybuilder world to be getting up to that number or be someone who is like, you know, like six and a half feet tall, 250 pounds to have the appetite to put that side of type of, and then in that case, you know, that's, that's an outlier just from a size standpoint. So, you know, whatever ceiling would be for them is likely different than say someone like, my, or like any of us. So, uh, what I'm not six, five, yeah. <laughs> there, there's always <laughs> hope you, like, could, you could grow again. <laughs> like, well, you know, what happens, unfortunately, is there will be one Yahoo that, you know, drinks a whole gallon of whey protein and gets right. you know, getting four or 500 grams a day and ends up feeling nauseous. And then they'll, and that will become the narrative, you know? So, um, but yeah, that would be incredibly challenging. And in my 11 years of practicing as a dietitian, I never had a patient get close (laughs) that I'm aware of to 300 grams of protein. Right. Yeah. And I find like like, just general principle, if you ever find yourself having to like force yourself to do something to that degree, then there's probably some unforeseen consequences because your body's telling you something. If it's like, I can't, physically, I'm physically having a hard time doing this. So, um, from a, from a digestion standpoint, anyhow, but awesome. Well, uh, thanks a bunch, uh, Dr. Lyon and, uh, and Michelle for, uh, hopping on the line and, and chatting with this. This will be a fun one to, to put up. All right. Thanks so much for having me, you guys. Yeah. Thanks for being on here. And I should, before we go off for our listeners that want to check out what you're up to, Dr. Lyon, do you have any specific website, social media handles you'd like to share? I do. It's my name, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Um, I'm pretty active on Instagram. I have a newsletter. I put curated studies in there. I have a YouTube channel, which is actually with Dr. Donald Lehman. And I'm going to have some other guest experts come on and just kind of talk and really clear up some of these narratives and I do my very best to deliver uh, evidence-based information to people um, and yeah, anywhere else. And they can download my free protocol. So I have um, a line protocol on my website. You can download that. Awesome. Well, I'm sure a lot of listeners are going to head over there and check that stuff out. Michelle, oh. where can we find you? Oh yeah. So I am most active on Instagram. You can follow me at run, eat, meet, repeat. I'm also on Twitter at Michelle Hearn RD. I do not argue or engage um, in negative things on Twitter. You can um, check out my website, thedietitiansdilemma.net, and you can buy the book, The Dietitian's Dilemma, is on Amazon. We've got the uh, paperback and the ebook, and the summer, at the end of the summer, we should have the audiobook. Awesome. Well, thanks again to both of you for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please consider checking out my website at zachbitter.com or my social media channels at ZachBitter on Instagram, at ZBitter on Twitter, and at Zach.Bitter on Facebook. You can also support the show by subscribing and leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform. If you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to send me an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.